Have you ever considered the fact that you can never make yourself laugh because you know the punchline already? You know what I mean? So I think that I might be um, among three people on earth least qualified to make that assessment. Like, what we are is a group of dudes that I, I would love if the notion of our band was that we are authentic, we're the same people on the stage as we are off the stage, we're the same people on our records as we are in life, and that there's like an intellectualism and an aggressive, like, sort of like rock and roll attitude and a an exploration of things that are often written off as stupid that can be delved more deeply into and all of that stuff can be married. I would like that to be the, the idea. I'm not the one to say that that is the idea. <laughs> We started being a band in 99, and so I guess I began writing for the Lawrence Arms right around then, maybe 98. The first song I wrote was uh, Evening of Extraordinary Circumstance, and that was what, to me, was the impetus to try to gather these guys together. Chris and I had been in a band called The Broadways before, and we were like a sort of a political punk band, and that ended, and I don't think either of us knew what we wanted to do musically after that. I wrote this one particular song when I was like in a pretty like dark place. I was on the bus coming home from school and it just sounded different. It had like a different like emotional bent and a different just tack. I mean, listen, I, I write four chord punk songs. I'm not trying to say that I was doing anything profound, but to me it was like, oh, this actually sounds like the kind of band I'd like to be in. I started writing songs when I was really, really young, you know, so like by the time I was writing for the Lawrence Arms, I mean, at that point, my influence was just like sort of malaise and despair, just like the bump and grind of day-to-day -day life. I can say this, the Lawrence Arms have been compared to a lot of different bands. We've been compared to Jawbreaker, we've been compared to the Alkaline Trio, but we started off to sound like the Goo Goo Dolls, and we, we've done a damn good job. If you play the record Hold Me Up for someone and tell them that it's a Lawrence Arms record, they will believe you. <laughs> they just had this like scrubby, like we're not that good at this and we don't give a shit kind of vibe, I think, and they had dual singers, and the one guy who couldn't really sing had so much style that it didn't matter that he couldn't really sing, and that really appealed to me as <laughs> someone who can't really sing. They were just like a crucial part of like the uh, the pantheon of things that I listened to. You know, they're they're canonical for Chris and I. Like uh, we we grew up together. We we've been friends since we were you know fourth fifth grade or something. The Goo Goo Dolls are one of the first things that we bonded. We got the Jed album, and it's a really cool like dirty punk record. And then Hold Me Up is like this refined take on that, and we were both blown away and then they came out with Iris and we were like oh you think we sound like Jawbreaker that's fun okay yeah yeah Jawbreaker <laughs> I am straight up just ripping off Robbie from the Goo Goo Dolls I used to try to sing like Joe from the Dead Milk Men when I was younger they were like my first favorite band and I was terrible at that and then one day Chris and I were in a very like one of our early like proto bands called Glad Hand first band that uh, I think either of us were in that ever played a show. We had this song and I was impersonating Joe from the Dead Milkmen and it wasn't going well. And so then I was like, why don't I just impersonate the guy from the Goo Goo Dolls? And I tried that and then these guys were like, that sounded a lot better. That was, <laughs> that was really cool. And I was like, okay, I'll do this forever. And uh, you know, obviously it's like evolved into being my own thing, but it was, it, it was all based on like complete parroting at first. And it's only just, the fact that I've got this actual shitty throat and accent that it's turned into what it is. Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting about the way uh, we work, or perhaps just what's unique, is that there are not very many Lawrence Arm songs that are sort of like traditionally co written. You know, it's not like we're like sitting around like bouncing words off of each other and like riff like melodies off of each other. And for as long as we've known each other and been doing this, it's like we create 
songs and we bring them to the table together and it often becomes um, inspiring or like motivating. Is it hard to be, you know, like two storytellers? I think the answer is that yes, it is. I think what works specifically for the Lawrence Arms is that Brendan and I have a lot of overlap and we are also, you know, different humans with like, <laughs> you know, unique, uh, you know, thoughts and emotions or whatever. Uh, but there's like a big overlap in like the Venn diagram of us. And what makes it interesting is that there is a friction and like a tension and conflict that is generated by both of us writing songs for this band. And I think over time, that's really evolved into like who we are as a band. Like our, our identity is really based in this kind of duality and this friction that's generated by two storytellers. When I sit down to write a record, I just write words, I write pages and pages every day, and I'll write 10 songs in a week, you know, and uh, more, and most of them are garbage. I was reading an interview once with somebody, and they said something along the lines of like, this is the best song you've ever written, tell me about the songwriting process, and the uh, subject said, you know, that song came out of me in like three minutes, and I realized that's how every great song is described by the artist that creates it. The really great ones just fly out of you. So I decided it was somewhere in the middle of the greatest story ever told process. I consciously remember that. I was like, that's it. I'm not writing any songs that don't fall out of me, like almost fully formed. What I like to do is crank out lyrics, and if those lyrics inspire me, I'm not a good enough guitar player, and I don't know chords, I don't really write riffs, I have to be inspired by the lyrics first. Chris is um, much more melodic and uh, creative on his instrument than I am. He cranks out a lot of material and he finds a way to kind of locate the stuff that he's really stoked about. I mean, he's always been, but he's really found a way to, I think, refine it, which I've always kind of been jealous of his capacity to be able to do that. Um, I'm much more of like a copy and paste guy, like collage person. But, but if I have like a, a bunch of words on a bunch of pages and I'm just trying to find like the common themes and I'm going through lines and I'm like cutting, I'm rearranging and I'm cutting and pasting, I'm figuring out how things fit together. I'm much more of like a puzzle person. It's like putting together um, disparate pieces you know until finally something starts to make sense to me uh, and then like really like pushing hard in that direction once that starts to become fully formed and like visible I think we've always always looked at a body of work when we were actually got to making a record and we're like okay you know here's what we have and this is how it goes together and you know I think we're also I guess we've been lucky in the sense that yeah, Brendan and I uh, share an enormous amount in common in terms of how we see the world. There are some contrasts and some differences there, but we always seem to arrive in uh, a kind of shared location. I don't think Metropole is about getting old. Metropole is about isolation. Metropole is about being alone in a city. And one of the big things that is like part and parcel with being alone is self-reflection and examination. So, to give you like an easy example, I go to a bar with Chris and Neil and you and you and we sit down. We're just a bunch of people out at a bar. But when everybody moves away and I go to a bar by myself, I'm just the old guy at the end of the bar. So like that becomes something that is like endemic in isolation is this sort of like realization of how you're perceived from the outside, right? And that's what I think Metropole's about, and I don't mean to be prescriptive, but like that was sort of, I think, a bit of the intentionality is like the idea of being like, we're three dudes alone in three big cities, and we're all three alone. Like, everybody's moved out of Chicago, you know? Chris didn't know anybody when he moved to Portland. I mean, you know, and Neil lives alone in LA. And so it's like that was the product of the isolation of a big city 
the uh, anonymous metropolis, which is obviously Metropole, like, right? That's where the title comes from. With apathy and exhaustion, uh, the perspective was just really different. I mean, that was a different time. Weirdly, like, we wrote that record, then 9-11 happened, and then we recorded the record. So it was, like, a very odd time. Um, and it's really hard for me to go back and remember the writing process. I remember rehearsing for it, and I specifically remember there being like, uh, like no fly zone over Chicago, and us being under the traditional paths of the airplanes, and being like, "Holy shit! There's no planes. This is fucking weird," and just kind of like that, like uncertainty that was like, you know, uh, happening at that time. But I can't really remember what the fuck we were thinking when we wrote that record. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, I know that we wanted to make a poppy record with choruses and parts, and that was something that we had never experimented with before. We had always, like, it was like we'd subverted the traditional songwriting paradigm before we even got good at it. You know what I mean? Like, we decided we never had to learn to draw. It, like we went straight to Picasso's like cubism phase without going through the blue period, if that makes sense. I mean with Old Calcutta we did have like specific goals. Like we really did want to write a record that was the kind of record we would have loved when we were growing up. And the records that we did love and were exposed to when we were, you know, teenagers and we got into punk rock music. Like let's make a record that's the record that would blow our minds when we were fifteen. And that was the conscious decision. And then the uh, less conscious decision was I snapped my kneecap in half <laughs> and uh, was in a cast that was like from like above my nuts to below my ankle for seven months. And I was fucking furious. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was a terrible, terrible time in my life. And we were rehearsing above a dog groomer in a place with no windows and it smelled like wet dogs and you're gonna get some angry songs out of that i think <laughs> well the requiem revisited is like an homage to naked ray gun who's a band that uh we grew up going to see and greatly admiring and at the beginning of that very song we um also uh whisper lyrics from a No Means No song, and we also whisper lyrics from a No Means No song in Great Lakes, Great Escapes, um, in, in one of the instrumental breakdowns, and uh, to me, that's important. I heard somebody once say, you know, never deny your influences. It's key to check your references, even if they're like, not cool, even if they're the Goo Goo Dolls. Just get out there and be honest, you know? Whatever like art you do is beholden to its medium first and foremost. So it's like we're a band, so the most important thing is that it sounds cool. The most important thing for a picture to be is something you want to look at. You know, the most important thing for a movie is to be something you want to watch. People are like, and now I feel like this is a really, this is like an epidemic in, because of this like sort of like mass punditry with like everybody having a platform with Twitter and like the internet and everything. And everybody tells you like what's wrong with the lesson that this piece of art teaches you. And every piece of art doesn't have to teach you a lesson at all. Every piece of art is beholden to look cool, sound cool, read well, or be watchable. And if it teaches you a lesson, and if it does it in a non-didactic way, that's a great piece of art. But if it doesn't, it can also be a great piece of art. Push It by Salt and Pepper is a good fucking jam. And that's because it's got a good bass line, you know, and that's it. And it doesn't have to have any more than that. So to answer your question, the most important illusions on O'Calcutta are to the musicians and artists that influence us to be musicians, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. The Lawrence Arms are about, I think, a few core things. The goal has always been to try to write our own stories, and we're fortunate to be a band that's been around for 20 years playing at all. But the main component here is like, it's gotta sound cool. You know, the songs have to be cool, and the record, and like, they have to sound cool. That's like the, that's where it all pins from. Like, I don't know what the next record will be like, 
I think it will sound like the Lawrence Arms, which means that like there's some shifts, but we have a pretty like clear lane about what in terms of what we sound like now. Like I think Apathy and Exhaustion to Greatest Story to O Calcutta to Metropole all have like while subtle, <laughs> like clear sort of shifts. But there's clearly also like a current that's that that rides through them all. So to me the goal of the next record would be like it should sound like the Lawrence Arms. <laughs> I kind of think there's nothing cooler than the person you underestimate that ends up being very intelligent. The guy that can talk about Porky's and can also uh, talk about, you know, Kierkegaard, right? Like that, that sort of duality has always appealed to me. I guess in my own little way, I tried to, you know, fit, fit into that as far as I can branch on both sides. You know, I think that's been something that's been appealing to all of us about art in general. It's like playing music with your with your best friends is um, is a luxury, and uh, to be in the Lawrence Arms is is pretty fucking cool. Still, even as uh, we kind of have been doing this for so long, so I think the goal is to always be in the Lawrence Arms. You know, this is this is kind of a um, kind of locked into this thing for life. What kind of 